Hello, uh, I'm Aparna from IIT Bombay and I'm going to talk to you about the module on Right to the City which comes under Sociology of Urban Transformations. So let us see what we are going to learn in this module. Uh, this module tries to understand the notion of production of space particularly in the context of the urban and how complex economic, political and social processes shape urban spaces. To understand the idea of uh, the right to city uh, as articulated by Lefebvre and to be able to apply his idea to the urban transformations which uh, takes place around us. This model also tries to understand to link global, national and local processes in the context of uh, the urban and understand uh, connections that exist between capitalist processes and urbanization. A rapidly growing percentage of the world's population now resides in cities. In fact, the reader of this essay is most likely an urban dweller. So these questions are for, for us and for you. How do you see yourself in relation to the landscape that you inhabit? What is the nature of public space in your city? How do people from various social classes, from, from across gender, ages, caste and religious backgrounds, how do they inhabit the city? In what ways do the inhabitants of the city contribute towards the construction of public and private spaces in the city? And what is the nature of interactions between the residents of the city administrators and residents, between the residents and the city administrators? So in your city, what kind of spaces are occupied by the marginalized groups? It is not difficult to notice that the urban environment around us is changing at a rapid pace. Geographers and the other urban theorists have linked these changes to wider processes of globalization and neoliberalism. Structures of urban governance are changing and are becoming more and more distant away from the reality of everyday struggles of inhabitants of the city. The possibility that urban residents will have a say in shaping their city spaces is vanishing. Consider, for example, the urban changes that accompany the organization of Commonwealth Games in New Delhi. So, uh, on the one hand, there were massive slum demolitions and on the other, government invested huge funds on infrastructure projects. So, during this time, the government tried to cover the face of poverty, which was prevalent in the every, every nook and corner of the city uh, from the public view, uh, in the process of transforming Delhi into a glossy world-class city. How were such decisions made? Which citizens of the city get to have a say in such kind of decisions and that also to what extent and who are left out in this process? Purcell in his paper titled Excavating Lefebvre, the right to the city and its urban politics of the inhabitant, he argues that the neoliberal political environment disenfranchises the citizens of the city and that we need to build upon the idea of right to the city in order to counter such urbanism. The right to the city is an idea that seeks to transform the nature of urban spaces and whose roots lie in the quest for spatial justice. Uh, the idea uh, was first discussed by the French Marxist social theorist Henri Lefebvre while writing around the centenary year of the publication of Karl Marx's Das Kapital and just before the uprising of workers and students uh, in May 1968 in Paris. Uh, these were turbulent times and cities all over the world uh, like Detroit, Tokyo, Prague, Mexico, they were challenging capitalism, war, they were challenging patriarchy and racism. So while the ground reasons that resulted in these protests varied from city to city, what united these cities was a sense of alienation which came from living a modern urban life and the political empathy towards their struggles. It is worthwhile to note that Lefebvre was writing at a time when one third of the population had come to reside in urban areas. Today we have crossed the 50% mark. So Lefebvre outlined his vision for, uh, for the right to the city in his book, uh, uh, laid it, uh, draw it a la Ville. 1967, uh, which we can translate as the right to the city, where he sought to reclaim the city from the bourgeoisies and for, for, from a technocratic rationalism. The book, which appears more like a collection of notes, is written with, with a sense of political urgency. 
so the right to the city uh, was followed by a more sober la revolution urbane in 1970 so lefebvre's work on the urban have been instrumental in conceptualizing the idea of urban urban uh, uh, both as uh, both the processes that needs to be theorized uh, as it's central uh, as it is central to capitalism and both as a site for political organizing so even though the urban uprising of 1968 did not eventually succeed the sense that city is the site for social struggle uh, it captured the imaginations of the left of the, of that period and continue to do so today the Marxist geographer David Harvey, who writes on the current conjectures where urban processes are inextricably and visibly embedded in global processes, he draws heavily on Lefebvre's ideas of right to the city and production of space. Harvey claims that he had only uh, Lefebvre's work to turn, on, turn to for a Marxist understanding of the city. His book Social Justice uh, and the City brought a Lefebvrean sensibility to the Anglo-American context. Uh, Lefebvrean sensibility and was in, inspired primarily by La Revolution of Bain and alongside Harvey's own readings uh, of Marx's uh, Das Kapital. Many of these ideas were further developed by Harvey to write several other books including but not limited to uh, such as Limits of Limits to Capital, The Urbanization of Capital, Con Consciousness and the Urban Experience, Condition of Postmodernity and Paris, A, a Capital of Modernity. Both Harvey and Lefebvre, they have engaged with a wide range of ideas from art, architecture, literature, economy, philosophy and politics. However, both of them have insisted uh, on an intense engagement <clears throat> with the urban question and the city as a side that is both reflective of and constitute of modern social relations. Lefebvre, uh, as the director of the Institute de Sociology Abuin, at um, Nantrere uh, pushed towards making the teaching of urbanism an interdisciplinary subject and here uh, he also advised his students to observe critically question and work towards transformation. Keeping all of this in mind it would be meaningless to talk about the right to the city without a wider understanding of the conception of space as developed by Lefebvre and Harvey and its relationship to urban, economic and social processes. Production of Space Bringing in space into social theory, Lefebvre averred that from Heraclitus to Hegel to Marx, dialectical thinking has been bound up with time. One of his key contributions has been to think about dialectics in spatial terms. This understanding of dialectic differs from a Hegelian dialectic, the thesis antithesis th synthesis and is extremely open-ended, stressing movement rather than resolution, the dialectic according to Lefebvre, quote unquote, highlights the relationship between form and contents and dissolves stable morphologies to such an extent that stability becomes a problem. This dialectic is conceptualized not in binary terms, but more often than not a triad, such as production, exchange, accumulation. These forces are, are in continual relationship with each other and the shifting balance between them produces particular configurations of spatial and social relations. Such an approach can be applied to an understanding of how space is produced. Space is seen by Lefebvre as a product to be used, to be consumed. It is also a means of production, networks of exchange and flows of raw materials and energy fashion space and are determined by it. This continual dialectical process can also be understood by breaking two different moments in space. Lefebvre discusses conceived space to refer to the abstract spaces that are conceptualized or planned by architects, the state, cartographer or urban planners. An example of conceived space is the grid laid out in a planned city. 
which passes land in fixed ways and the sign land used to the properties. The conceived space often ignores perceived space, which is the space of popular perception and action. Perceived space then includes the popular meanings that are assigned to the place such as place can be seen as sacred, center of power, exalted, etc. However, the fully human person also resides in lived space, lay vacuum. Lived space brings together the spaces of imagination and everyday life. In modern society, this space is suppressed and controlled by the structures of capitalism and state control and yet it lives on in the works of art and literature and in fantasy. Lefebvre's interactions with the artist and particularly surrealists and architects of that period and his involvement with radical movements such as Situationist International helped him to develop his ideas on viewing space as political and challenging the taken for granted notions of space. At a time when the state and capitalist forces were imposing a technical rationality on the lived rhythms of everyday life, Lefebvre was questioning the complacency of those around him and wondering how population were allowing themselves to be controlled and were quietly accepting the changes imposed in their lived spaces. The production of space argument provides a tool to examine urban space in an open-ended manner paying particular attention to struggles that constitute the form, meanings, actions and subjectivities that are constituted by and constituted of the space itself. David Harvey urges us think about space in relational terms. He argues that as opposed to looking at a space as absolute, such as the space of Newton or Descartes, or even as relative, Einsteinian space where space curves or bends, but time remains fixed. We need to conceptualize space-time as relation. Any event or object in space cannot be understood through a lens of fixed time or a space. The particular relation between objects and processes is constituted by a range of influences on that space in the past, present and future. And the nature of a point is defined by how these would congeal at a particular point. Harvey goes on to illustrate this somewhat abstract understanding by giving an example of him delivering a lecture in a room. To hear him, people are situated in a room, a bounded space absolute space. However, within the room people are located at varying distances from him and therefore the reach of his words might be different for different locations. Relative space. However, each individual within that room is also constituted by their memoirs, thoughts, conditioning and so on. And therefore, will relate differently to the content of Harvey's talk. This is a relational understanding of space-time. Space for Harvey can only be understood through human practice. Therefore, space itself is neither absolute, relative of relational in itself, but it can become one or all simultaneously depending on circumstances. Any understanding of urban processes then requires an understanding of how human activity creates particular spatial configurations and concepts that resolve with consummate ease seemingly deep philosophical mysteries concerning the nature of space and the relationships between social processes and spatial forms. Both Lefebvre and Harvey wrote this understanding of the production of space 
to bear upon their analysis of the urban and of how city firms and processes are constituted and in turn constitute subjectivities. In the other section, we will examine these ideas through their writings on the right to city. Henry Lefebvre writings on the city. Henry Lefebvre have written extensively on social and political aspects of the city, and here we will be discussing how he understands the city through a few of his prominent writing. Lady Wright a la Ville. The right to city critique the notion of the city as a purely mechanical process that is non ideological. La Revolution of Bain. The urban revolution developed this critique further by illustrating through a reading of his history of urbanism. Lefebvre discussed how ideology has played a role in the shaping of cities in the ancient, medieval, and now the modern period. His aims in these writings was to awaken a political consciousness in the popular imagination about urban processes. Urbanism, for him, was too important to be left purely in the hands of technocrats and bureaucrats. City spaces are not fixed, but can be seen as dialectically moving between the planned idea and the lived reality, between form and content, between thought and practice. The city, according to Lefebvre, is an over and not a product. It is a work of art and not a mere conglomeration of economic or political structures. And in this overall, all inhabitants participate. It is not only wealth that is accumulated in cities, but also knowledge, techniques and arts. The city streets, squares and its monuments are sites for a la fete, places of gathering celebration and centers of unproductive consumption. Alongside cities also plays where the rich and the poor, the powerful and the popular are in conflict of the usage of the city spaces. Given examples from medieval and ancient cities, he shows how the rich and the powerful make use of their wealth to materially and symbolically claim spaces in the city. Through a pompous buildings of monuments, fountains, and embellishments. The working classes also bring beauty to the city spaces through their festivities and celebrations. However, in modern society, the production of products has replaced the creation of things of beauty. In industrializing France, particularly Paris, the poor were being pushed away from the city center, which were then replaced by mundane offices, whereas the well-to-do moved into suburbs effectively emptying the urban center. These shifts erase the social relations connected with the lived urban spaces of diversity, conflict of a la fete with a more technocratic organization. In the urban revolution, which Lefebvre wrote after the 1968 uprising, he argues that urbanization is a site for surplus accumulation and so is a key of the survival of capitalism. He predicted that cities are a crucial for focus for any political struggle, particularly those based on class. Lefebvre sought to emphasize that city spaces are not only to be seen in terms of exchange value, but also their use value. However, both contemporary state centered planning and capitalist processes prioritize exchange value. Such a perceptive effectively crushes the over in the city and leads to alienation. The city is a place of encounter, a place where people from diverse backgrounds, classes and imagination struggle over the shape of the city. And out of this struggle emerges the over, that is, the city. However, in the way the bourgeoisie's city is emerging, the cities are being produced for us rather than by us. Monolithic state-centric planning of the city does not allow for difference and cities have become the sites of expropriation rather than of participation. And Lefebvre argues 
that the inhabitants of a city have rights the right to inhabit the right to participate and right to make the city in their images the right to the city for lefebvre is both a cry and a demand the cry is an expression of the existential pain felt in the alienation of everyday life in modern times the demand is that we confront with this reality and create an alternative urban reality which is meaningful less alienating playful while at the same time engaged the fabrice demands was for a city that is open to encounters to difference to conflict to pleasures and is in continual dialectical movement the fabre differed from conventional marxist in his belief that the site for revolution is the city as opposed to the factory floor however he was committed to the overthrowing of capitalism and the exploitative structures that constitute city and the right to city was a move in that direction david harvey on social justice and the city harvey in writing social justice and the city sought to bring into conversation those that professed a sociological imagination with those possessed by a spatial consciousness or say geographical imagination this was also the first major work that systematically sought to use a marxist geography to understand urban systems in social justice and the city harvey moves from a reformist appeal for territorial urban justice to calling for a complete urban revolution using marx harvey developed a theoretical understanding of how urban processes act as conduits of capitalist circulation ghettos and urban polarization along with other forms of social exclusion are an inevitable result of capitalist urbanization in a more recent essay entitled right to the city he quotes robert park an urban sociologist to argue that the kind of city we built cannot be dissociated from the nature of social ties that we would like to nurture the kinds of humans we want to be and the kind of values we cherish quote begins man's most successful attempt to remake the world he lives in more after his heart's desire but if the city is the world which man created it is the world in which he is henceforth condemned to live thus indirectly and without any clear sense of the nature of his task in making the city man has remade himself the right to the city as conceptualized by lefebvre and elaborated by harvey is therefore of utmost importance it is not merely a right to inhabit the city but to have a role to play in giving it a form the right to city is the right to shape the world we live in and so it is a right to shape ourselves this is not an individual right and any urban transformation has to be achieved through a collective exercise however this is not a right that is evenly or is easily attainable both the state and capital seek to make the city to proclaim power and to resolve crises historically cities have emerged as a result of geographical and social concentrations of surplus wealth in that sense urbanization has always been a class phenomenon capitalism enables surplus to be appropriated from many whereas the distribution of surplus lies in the hands of a few moreover the perpetual search for profits creates conditions for over accumulation and surplus labor leads to crisis how he argues that urbanization a process dependent upon investment in infrastructure industry housing etc becomes a site to observe this surplus capital and labor a special fix historically we can take the example of 1840s paris where the crisis of unemployment and surplus capital was solved 
to the implementation of a project to redesign and build Paris. It is at an entirely different scale, complete with wide bold words and grand shopping arcades. Much of this reconstruction was achieved through state-sponsored and debt financed infrastructure development, thus putting previously unemployed labor to work and fixing the surplus into real estate. This urban transformation of Paris changed the socio-spatial relations in the city. It effectively displaced the urban poor, the dangerous classes and their insalubrious homes from the center. It annexed the unruly suburbs through massive road and rail connections and propelled the urban population into an era of speed. The newly emerging credit institutions enabled the bourgeoisies to strengthen their hold on the city and facilitated the free movement of capital. Paris is often looked at the, as the model for capitalist-led urbanization for the world over. Cities begin to be seen as centers of consumerism, where the tourism industry, fashion showrooms, pleasure cafes, etc., would create a new urban persona. The crisis of capitalism was solved, albeit temporarily, but through the scaling of consumerism. Following Paris, New York was similarly transformed as were urban centers all over the world. Middle classes became staunch defenders of private property with their debt financed homes in the suburbs, and the working classes were uprooted from their homes leading to ghost in the city areas. This spatial fix was temporary and once again the world saw financial crisis in the 1960s. Alongside the discontent and alienation of modern suburban life coupled with protest against racism, patriarchy, war constituted the urban revolution of 1968. In its continuous search for profit and recurring crisis and spatial fixes Capitalism has created a world where the nature of the urban process is now global. The housing sector in the United States and now the urbanization of China have both been central to absorbing surpluses and fueling the global expansion of capitalism. The uneven flows of capital are etched onto the special farms of today's cities, where unprecedented riches exist alongside increasing poverty. Cities all over the world now consist of gated communities, civil streets, stentious shopping malls, and exclusive clubs. Pushed to the peripheries are the migrant laborers, the homeless, the poor working classes. Exchange value has taken over use value. Yet another consequence of capitalist urbanization has been the dispossession and destruction of the homes and workplaces of the urban poor. How they using Marxist parallels refers to this process as creative destruction. The new cities are built on the ruins of old forms of spatial and social relationships. The destruction almost always results in the displacement of low-income communities from their neighborhoods to consolidate the control of capital and put the land to a higher use. The difference in the land prices is appropriated by the capitalist classes and such a process enables accumulation by dispossession. Contemporary urbanization under capitalism relies primarily on such dispossessions. Quite obviously, this process is not without its conflicts and contradictions and those dispossessed often take off to the streets or the courts to protest and fight for their right to the city. However, as stated by Marx, between equal rights, force decides. So let's talk about right to that city in an Indian context. These days we hear a lot of talk about smart cities or world class cities. Uh, would the smart city be equally smart for all sections of society? Would it be accessible to all? And what does it mean to have a world class city? At a point in Indian history where we are poised to engage even more intensely uh, with the global economy, it is imperative that we pause and ponder over these questions. Let us take a look at Gurgaon, India's millennium city, 
a city that has developed as a result of coalitions between speculative real estate developers and and the public sector that was all too willing to cater to private interests what is created as a result is a fragmented fragmented urban space where land is parceled into visible pockets of capitalist accumulation and invisible zones of capitalist exploitation the migrant populations that labor in the homes offices and factories of gurgaon they live in urban villages uh, in the peripheries of gurgaon with practically no access to gated communities of the aspiration aspirational middle class the disparities are built into fabric of the city uh, is this the nature of the new world class cities that we are in envisioning urban redevelopment in contemporary india appears not too different from the capitalist transformations of paris mid 1800s so what does it mean to talk about the right to the city uh, in the indian context the capitalist model of accumulation has altered the relationship between the state private sector and civil society in all parts of the world and india is no exception gautam bhans one uh, work on ev evictions in delhi shows how there has been a significant shift in the popular discourse about the poor working classes in urban india and how they are represented and governed bhan argues us to contemplate on his uh, on the shift and reflect on how these representation representations enable evictions to be understood as acts of governance rather than violations in order to understand this shift uh, let us look at few judgments by the supreme court of india that is in general seen as as a protector of the rights of the ordinary citizen of india so in 1985 judgment uh, for the case of olga telis versus bombay municipal corporation the supreme court argued that the right to livelihood is imperative uh, for the right to life and an eviction of the pavement dwellers will effectively then be a deprivation of their right to life it ruled that the urban poor are not claiming the right to dwell uh, on pavements or in slums for the purpose of pursuing an activity which is illegal immoral or contrary to public interest in india of the 1980s the right to the city for the urban poor could be claimed on the basis of their urban residency and citizenship in india of 2000s this right has systematically been eroded through law urban planning and through a discourse that sees the urban poor as pickpocketers rather than contributing citizens according to this discourse the urban poor with their unesthetic slums are coming in the way of the world class indian cities indian cities are zones of contestation between mobile and powerful global capital and the more spatially anchored masses of urban poor an illustration of this urban contestation is dharavi which is asia's largest slum owing to the expansion of mumbai dharavi now occupies a central space in the city it houses 9% of mumbai's population which is about 10 lakh people over an area of 174 hectare it is also hub of entrepreneurial activity and small businesses ranging from leather training tailoring small manufacturing and recycling units in order to make mumbai in the image of the envisioned world class financial center the municipal corporation of mumbai plans to redevelop this area the proposal is to build high rise apartments to the house at the existing some residents effectively freeing up 60% of currently occupied land for real estate development the dharavi bachao andolan committee has opposed this renewal program and is arguing for the tremendous amount of economic activities that happen in dharavi which was a turnover of around 40000 crore rupees and this will be lost as people will be unable to continue such activities inside flats a stay order from the high court has currently stalled the project until there is a legal consent of the residents the dharavi case shows how the tensions between use value and exchange value play out in capitalist led urbanization it also shows the conflict that has surfaced in several indian cities between the city spaces as sites of work and city spaces as sites of residence
in all major cities of India. Urbanization is visibly a class phenomenon. The urban bourgeoisie, with access to global capital, is becoming influential in urban governance, particularly deciding who has the right to the city and who does not. Urban space is being cleansed of hawkers, rickshaw pullers, informal workers, and the homeless. Urban reconstruction along is being pushed in the direction of IT parks, golf courses, gated communities with their private swimming pools and lawns, theme parks, and so on. Spaces open only for the affluent classes. This new urbanism shifts the emphasis from the urban areas as centers for production to a center for consumption and circulation of capital in the built environment. So let us summarize what we have learned in this module. One of the criticism of the idea behind the right to city is that it is an abstract idea and an empty signifier and depends on who is asking for that right. The notion of the right to the city can be invoked as much by corporate interest and the bourgeoisie as by the street dweller. In fact, more and more it is the middle class people who through mechanisms of power, governance and law such as the PIL, they are invoking their right to the city. The right to the city then appears not as a right of the, of the poor to survive but as an urban materialis materialization of the aesthetics which is combined with the fear of the middle classes. Moreover, Lefebvre's formulation of the right to the city has a certain revolutionary appeal, which is somewhat subdued in the way right to the city has been appropriated by national and international institutions. The institutional approach to the right to the city is perhaps more pragmatic uh, and the emphasis is on issues such as housing, livelihood, clean water. However, the uh, the totality that characterizes the Lefebvrean conception uh, is lost in, in such process and each one of these rights, like housing, livelihood, appears as a fragmentary approach. The transformative potential of Lefebvre's uh, idea of right to the city lies in looking at the city as, as central to the global capitalist circulation. A collective of multiple and diverse users and, and, and as a site for appropriation and distributional, distribution of resources. Such an approach allows an analytical clarity that can help uh, to direct the movement towards socially and especially just cities. So let us go back to Lefebvre's argument about the right to the city. The right to the city complemented by the right to, the, to difference and the right to information should modify concretize and make more practical the rights of the citizens as an urban dweller and user of multiple services. It would affirm on the one hand the right of the user to make known uh, their ideas on the space and time of their activities in the area and on the other hand it would also cover the right to the use of the center, uh, a privileged place instead of being dispersed and stuck into ghettos uh, such as for workers, immigrants the marginal and even for the privileged. The right to the city is an incredibly open concept that takes into account differences, material rights and the right to make the city. This is a right that is earned by living in the city, by being an inhabitant, by making daily use of the city spaces, one is regarded as an urban citizen. The citizens of the city need to take control of the decisions uh, in an inclusive manner, of course, that shape their city, that produce urban space and not let it become the playground of global capitalist forces that are essentially seeking a temporary fix for their mobile capital. This could be one way of resisting the intensification of capitalist social relations and global restructuring. Thank you.